Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. This where we will go. Nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. In the 19th century United States, the Mississippi River was more than an inland waterway of economic importance. It was also both a political and cultural icon. This river separated east from west, and west of the Mississippi was the frontier. This cultural and political mindset was established at a small fur trading town in Missouri that straddled the river, and it was from this small town, known as St. Louis, that Lewis and Clark embarked on their famous expedition in May of 1804. From then on, to be the first to do something west of the Mississippi became quite the calling card for anyone seeking fame in the Old West. So it makes sense that the first car to be manufactured west of that river would carry the name of the city of its birth, St. Louis. So let's chat a bit about the two men that made that happen. The Lewis and Clark of the American automotive industry, George Doris and John French. George Preston Doris was born in 1874 in Nashville, Tennessee, as was John French. They were neighbors as children and remained friends throughout their lives. The two of them worked well together, having complimentary gifts. George was the thinker. John was the showman. As kids, John would come up with some sort of scheme to cause trouble, while George would figure out how to pull it off. Great stuff. Both of them went to school in Nashville, George for engineering and John for business management. At the age of 18, the young men decided to go into business together. They managed to buy a small old steamboat with the intention of ferrying people across the river. However, in Tennessee at the time, you had to be 21 to get a license to operate a ship's boiler. Rather than find someone who was older to join them, George simply designed and built a large single-cylinder gas engine to run the boat instead. Problem solved. John moved to St. Louis in Missouri in 1895 to help his father in his piano business. George stayed behind to run the boat business, as well as working with his brother in the bicycle shop. George was an avid reader and saw an article in the Scientific American about the Times Herald Auto Race of 1895 that was held in Chicago. The race was won by a Duryea that sported an engine very similar to the one in his excursion boat. And so, George got bit by the car bug. George wanted to make a car. First, he built another gas engine, a twin-cylinder, 196 cubic inch engine that could put out some seven horsepower. Using the facilities of his brother's bicycle shop, he spent the next year designing the rest of the car, the transmission, suspension, brakes, and such. By 1897, his car was up and running. Indeed, in the fall of that year, he and his car took a road trip of over 60 miles without a glitch. Meanwhile, in St. Louis, John also got the car bug itis and ordered a new Winton car in 1896, though the car didn't arrive until 1898. The amount of time it took to get the car was rather frustrating to him, and so John hatched a plan. With George's engineering skills and his own business and marketing expertise, the two of them could make cars themselves and get them to the customer way faster than Winton could. George was all over the idea, but they needed some money to build a factory. So John tapped the shoulder of his dad, who loaned him $5,000 to establish a car company. George headed out to St. Louis, and thus John and George founded the St. Louis Motor Carriage Company in 1898. Their partnership was very successful. John got the company up and running, handled the financials and marketing of their cars. George ran the factory and designed the cars themselves. And both of them were very good at what they did. John promoted their cars through magazine and newspaper ads, as well as races and trials. He came up with the slogan, Rigs That Run, to emphasize their reliability. George began to make design improvements that had never been seen on American cars at that time, patenting over a dozen inventions. Their first cars, two of them, rolled out of the factory in 1899. These first cars were basically copies of the car that George had built in 1897, that particular car having been converted into a small pickup truck for running errands to and from the factory. Thirty of them were sold the next year, and thus by 1900, the St. Louis Motor Carriage Company was not only the largest and only U.S. car manufacturer west of the Mississippi, but among the largest in the country. But George was just getting started. 
at this time in the automotive industry, European cars were much more technologically advanced than those in the USA, especially the French cars. George began to design and patent improvements to American cars at a great pace. Rack and pinion steering, a float-controlled carburetor, single-body engine and transmission that eliminated the need for intermediate chain drive, a greatly improved front suspension system. The St. Louis cars of late 1900 and into 1901 were the most technologically advanced in the United States and amongst the most advanced in the world. The new cars now used a single cylinder engine of about 8 horsepower of George's design with the sliding gear transmission being part of the engine housing. Two forward speeds and one reverse drove the rear wheels through chains. The car could reach 25 miles an hour and cruise at about 15 miles an hour and do it for miles and miles. John drove this design to every race, rally, or trial he could get to, proving over and over that their cars were rigs that run. Unfortunately, John French was injured in a collision with a trolley in 1902 and passed away in 1903 from those injuries. His brother Jesse took over the company, but he and George Doris didn't get along so well in the two parted ways. George started his own company, and although Jesse did keep the St. Louis company going for a few more years, it was out of business by 1907. George would continue to innovate and manufacture cars under his own name until 1926. But the pioneering duo of John French and George Doris will forever be known as the intrepid builders of America's first frontier car. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.